Greetings, everyone. This is Ehav Ever from the Chronicles of Ehav Ever, and today's video is going to be how the Oral Torah proves and establishes the Written Torah. Okay, so I know right away this is going to sound like a strange video to some people who are um, not familiar um, with this kind of uh, information that I'm going to be presenting in this video. Um, because usually what I run into is that there are people who, for example, let's say believe 100% in the the Tanakh, um, whereas people in English try to see the Hebrew Bible, but you know that's an incorrect uh, designation um, using the word Bible um, for what Jews use. And the issue is, is that there are people who make this huge separation between there being this written Torah, which they 100% agree with, and then saying that there's no such thing as an oral Torah. And in other videos, I've dealt with the fact that that is, um, you know, kind of a, a misleading uh, idea that some people have built up in their mind. <clears throat> and to be quite honest with you, I think it starts from a really um, integral point of people not understanding what the word Torah even means. So starting off with, and this is just using Jastrow's, um, you know, dictionary of uh, the, the Tanakh as well as the um, uh, Talmud and Midrashim. And Torah is, generally speaking, a word that means teaching. Um, in English, if you were to translate it, you could also use the word law. Um, you know, so often people say the, the, the law of Moses, for example, when they use it in English, usually kind of more in a, in a, a I would say, Christianized context. Um, in Hebrew, you could say, you heard me say many videos, Torah Moshe, which means the, the Torah of uh, Moshe, the Torah of Moses. Moses. But also Torah, it, linguistically, is also used to uh, as a, a sort of a way of, you know, a translate, you could say a designation, a character of nature. So you could say that, you know, the uh, what you see here in this um, section here, which is the way it's used in part of the Talmud, for example, is uh, Torah keli alob. Um, you know, that there's a way to use the word as, uh, you know, the nature of something, the character of something. Um so a question could be, well, how, you know, how, where do you get these definitions from? And as I've mentioned in some other videos, and it may not be clear unless I focus in on it, is that ancient Hebrew worked on a system of three-letter roots, meaning that words get their definitions from three-letter roots, generally speaking, unless they're words that come from other cultures um, that are used to describe things. You know, so for example, um, there's an idea that the Torah itself is what's called Lashon HaKodesh, which is like the language um, of Hashem, you know, in a sense of the, you know, not that Hashem speaks with a mouth like we do, because um, Hashem is, of course, not human, but the language of the Torah um, as dictated by uh, Hashem is the language that Hashem wanted to use with the text. So even if there was like some word that was, you know, like, let's say being used because the people were in Egypt, you know, or in talking a certain language or speaking to a certain person that was Egyptian, that is the language that Hashem entered into the Torah. And what has to be understood is that, okay, well, if we look at the, the three-letter root from which the word Torah comes from, it comes from a shorish, which you see in the middle of the page here, uh, which is Yud Resh He. And I mean, again, as I've mentioned in other videos, Hebrew is read from right to left. So the root, Yud Resh He, it comes from, has a meaning of to cast or to shoot. So often it's used for, like, used, for example, shooting an arrow or hitting a target. Um, so then when you look at the actual... Um, way that the word uh, Torah is derived from this root. Um, you know, for example, Torah uh, usually starts from the uh, the hefil of the word hurrah, for example, to instruct, which is the way that this root is used in this particular verb form. So hurrah means to instruct or teach. So that gives the word Torah the meaning of instruction, direction, precept, or, you know, potentially law, or mode or manner. Okay, and that's where we get the definition of the word Torah. So if we have something like, for example, that's a written Torah, then it means that that is something that's a written instruction, um, you know, or direction or precept or law or mode or manner, for example. But then you have, if you say something is an oral Torah or Torah Shabbat Peh, you're just simply saying that someone is orally giving you instruction, direction, a precept, a law, a mode or manner. And that's you know, very important because, for example, there's no way to have a written Torah if someone didn't already give you an oral Torah you know, or oral instruction. So then the question could be, well, what's the point of the Torah? Well, if we go back to the Shoresh, the three little root that it comes from of Yud Resh He, it's to hit a certain target, for example. So a written Torah, for example, has its own area of like, for example, you know, to have a written text is I'm meeting, I'm trying to reach a certain goal. I'm hitting a certain target. But then orally to have an oral Torah, oral instruction also has a certain point to it. 
Let's go backwards, sorry. So let's think about it. Okay, in the written Torah, are there any like signs? Because one of the arguments people make is there's nothing in the written Torah that gives any indication of there ever being an oral Torah. And that's why I would say that the written Torah is constantly saying that there's an oral Torah. And someone could ask, well, what do you mean? In many parts of the Torah, especially when you deal with like the, you know, the, the discussions between the creator of all things and Moshe Rabbeinu or Moshe, Mo Moses, as people say in English, there's places all over the Torah where it says, well, Yomer Adonai el Moshe, which means in translation, and Hashem said to Moses. So that is an oral instruction. You know, so there's, you know, points in the Torah all over the place before the written Torah ever comes into play, where it's constantly saying, well, Yomer Adonai el Moshe. Now, next, you know, there's always places where it says, what the Ber Elohim. So, for example, like you know, Elohim said, there's also, we grow El Moshe, what the Ber Adonai Elo. So, that's where, you know, for example, the beginning of the book, we you grow, or, um, uh, you know, where essentially it says, like Hashem called the Moshe and said, you know, to him, you know, the Ber Moshe El Bani Israel. So, it says that Moshe spoke to the people of Israel. It says, Siwa Adonai Otho. So Hashem, you know, you know, gave a mitzvah, you know, commanded, you know, something. And this says, for example, in Deuteronomy or Devarim, the book of the Deuteronomy starts out with, you know, in the, the first, I think, five uh, uh, verses of Pasukim saying, Moshe be'er et ha-Torah hazot lemor. So be'er, be'er po, et ha-Torah, Basically, this means that Moshe gave instructions or he, you know, like basically, you know, gave an explanation of the Torah. And basically the whole text of Deuteronomy is Moshe Rabbeinu giving oral instructions uh, to the people of Israel who were about to move into the land of Israel before he passed away. So one of the things that was, uh, you know, the challenge to this is that someone says, OK, well, wait a minute. If all that is, if there is was a written text, why would Moshe have to, like, explain anything? You just write it out, give it to them and say bye bye and then be done. You know, but obviously there was a reason why he had to explain things. And, you know, one of the things I always bring up is it would also be obvious that, you know, for example, the, the written Torah couldn't possibly explain every conversation that took place in the time frames that's given. So, for example, the, you know, the Torah gives like from the, you know, from the creation of all things to the death of Moshe Rabbeinu, which is like, you know, several thousands, thousands of years. So there's no way possible that the, the written Torah contains every instruction and every conversation or every explanation or every, every question about what's been mentioned, you know, within thousands of years. It's obviously like, if you will, like almost like a cliff notes, a short version of what happened. So, you know, concerning this point, you know, before the written Torah you know, came about, all mitzvot that were given were orally given and instructed and taught. Because again, the word Torah does not mean written text. The word Torah means instruction. And it just so happens that there's a written Torah. And before the written Torah, there was an oral instruction. Now, of course, you know, we know that some of that instruction went into the written Torah, but we can obviously say that the entire breadth of what was said or instructed could possibly have been in the written Torah based on its like length. The next thing we want to look at is Further in the Torah, one of the things that is commonly known by a lot of people is what's called the Shema. So starting at the top, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ahod. So I've covered this in other videos that, you know, basically the people, of, it's, it's like instructing the people of Israel to hear that Hashem is, you know, Ahod. Um, you know, Hashem is the Elo Elohim, and, you know, Hashem is Ahod. But then it continues and says, well, have to, et Adonai Elohecho, so essentially, it, you know, it's the instruction that Moshe Rabbeinu was giving to the people of Israel that they will, you know, we will love, you know, Hashem, um, you know, with all of our hearts, you know, with all of our souls and with all, you know, that we have, you know, with everything we possess. Now, just starting off here, what's interesting here is that this word here, wo have to, the, uh, which means you will love. If you were to like say this in modern Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, be wo havda, or ve havda, for example, in modern Hebrew, and usually ve havda, would mean past tense, you loved. Now, the thing is, it's understood by pretty much everyone who reads the Torah that this is what all have to. And because of what's called ta'amim, because of the stress, instead of me saying ve'ahavta, I said what all have to. The minute I say what all have to, what this means is, is that it means present tense, future tense, you will love. But the verb form is actually past tense in modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew doesn't act, you know, operate this way anymore, but ancient Hebrew did. So if it, this was written in the modern sense of Hebrew, this would mean you loved 
you know, Hashem with all your heart. So it's like past tense. You loved. It doesn't say like you will or you, you know, you are you are doing, you will do, for example. So continue and says, Okay, and it says that, you know, these things that Moshe Rabbeinu was like, So these things that Moshe Rabbeinu was commanding that day will be placed in our hearts. So in the red brackets, it says, what you know, what I'm about to state here, So Wishinantum is understood to mean to instruct. So like your sons, and you will speak them. So again, the word Torah means instruction. Moshe Rabbeinu is telling, you know, you know, people to instruct their children, you know, instruct their sons, and speak them. And it says, So essentially, we're supposed to, you know, um, you know, speak them, you know, while we're, you know, residing at our, our homes, while we're on our way. And, you know, when we're like, you know, laying down and when we rise up. So again, essentially, this is like commanding a, a situation of oral Torah. Because of the fact that it says, meaning that there's oral instruction. Now, does this mean, for example, that the only thing that a Jew is supposed to instruct his, his children is just what's exactly written? What if they ask questions? Well, how does how do you do that? What does that mean, Father? You know, I just explained, you know, for example, what the words mean in translation. So, for example, you know, someone could say, well, people who speak Hebrew would know. But if it, as I mentioned earlier, you know, about this word here, a person in modern Hebrew, if they were to read this with no knowledge of the Torah, they would have to have instructed to them that the word is we'ohavta, you know, based on ancient Hebrew, based on the Ta'amim, and not ve'ahavta, or we'ahavta, because ve'ahavta, ve'ahavta is past tense. We'ohavta is, you know, present tense, future tense. So let's go to a description of how Jews who hold by the Torah, um, Torah Moshe, describe how the Torah came about. Okay, so of course, the, the claim that is made, you know, by all Jews who keep Torah Moshe and all ancient Jewish communities, that, you know, before the written Torah came about, Hashem basically started a process of uh, commanding, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu in terms of what to be put in the written text. Um, you know, so there's one description that's given that's like a metaphor or, you know, just kind of a way of thinking of how it was given that basically Hashem both, you know, commanded, you know, if you will, orally through Nevoa, you know, to Moshe Rabbeinu what to write, as well as showed him what to write, meaning that Hashem already had a plan for what the written text here would be. And Moshe Rabbeinu simply copied what he was both told and shown. So even the spacings that you see here that are being made by this uh, scribe, this sofer, which I'm using as an example of Moshe Rabbeinu writing, all of these things were shown and commanded Moshe to put in because they're all elemental to the text. So that includes, you know, everything from like all the stories about like how, you know, the reality came about, Obviously, there, there had to have been more information about how that came about. It isn't just simply, you know, six days things were created. And I've talked about in another video that um, there's many sources that say that it wasn't just simply six days the way we say six days, um, but that, you know, one description is that it's like the stages of, you know, of creation in terms of, um, you know, what's relative to what we can learn from it and also relative to how humans understand things. Um, you know, the stories of the Avot, you know, the ancestors of the Jewish people, how we came about, the, you know, the information about the work that the priests were given, um, you know, as like some texts say that there's two sides to the whole situation. You know, that one part of the Torah is the story part of it, and one part of the Torah is the commands about, you know, how to actually maintain um, a Torah-based civilization in the land of Israel. Um, you know, practices that, you know, are... are in existence, whether the Jewish people are living in the land of Israel or whether we're in exile, um, you know, these practices continue no matter what. And all of these things were given in the written text, but many of them have no explanation of how to actually functionally do them. And when you look at how Jews do them, even if you look at Jews who reject the oral Torah um, that is considered to be rabbinical, if you will, they also have like an oral methodology of how they've passed on traditions of how to actually do what's written in the Torah. Because, you know, as many people have said, the, the Hebrew text of the written Torah is very ambiguous. And if you read it in translation, what you're essentially reading is someone's commentary on the Torah, where they've either done some research, either in the right way or the wrong way, into what they believe that the words should be if you translated them. And then from there, they went and said, okay, well, this is the way I'm going to explain to someone who's an English speaker that, you know, I can relate to about what these words mean. So again, if we go through thousands of years of Jewish history, you know, we can assume that there were probably most obviously periods of time where there were certain Jews who knew how to read, knew how to write, and there are certain Jews who didn't. 
So how would the Jews who didn't know how to read or write actually receive Torah? They would receive it orally. So of course, you get a group setting where someone's saying, okay, well, this is what this pasuk means. This is what this verse means in the Torah. And someone says, well, how do you do that? You know, what does that even mean? So we know that through Jewish history, you know, there was always explanations. Um, you know, with, there are situations where there are things that, you know, as a, as a man, you know, you wouldn't fully understand, only a woman would understand or vice versa. You know, and obviously that information was passed down orally also. You know, so there's no real way to have a functional society, um, you know, where you have everything written down, but you have nothing that's orally explained about it. Um, all written texts, you know, contain elements of um, oral tradition because that's the way most people learn. Most people learn by having things orally transmitted to them. I mean, even the ability to read is initially an oral thing because, you know, you have a child who learns how to read, you know, how to understand a language orally. And then only after that point do you actually start teaching them how to read. No one teaches a child how to read and then teaches them how to speak. Um, you know, so that, you know, because we know the word Torah means instruction, is how all things begin. It begins with an oral explanation of something, and then from there, a written explanation. So as with the title of this video, one of the things that I think some people don't realize, especially those who, um, you know, have kind of this... Uh, anti-oral Torah, like, uh, you know, slant to them, um, is the idea that there are five books of Moses is also an oral tor Torah concept, because who says that there's five books of Moses, for example? W where does that come from, from the text itself? I mean, if you look in the Torah, you know, where do you find that there's five books in the text? Why aren't there like 10 or 12? So what I'm, what do I mean by that? You know, a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll, consists of five elements based on pretty much what everybody agrees with. And this understanding of, of, you know, initially came from, you know, Jews who are nowadays called rabbinical Jews, but basically Jews who kept the Torah. That, you know, that came from Torah-based Jews, and even Samaritans have the same concept. That meaning that there's Bereshit, Shemot, Wayikoro, Bamidbor, Devorim. So for those who speak English, that would be like Genesis, the first book, you know, Exodus, the second book. Um... Leviticus, the, second, the third book, Numbers, and then also Deuteronomy. But those are also, I think, mostly, I think they're like Greek names. So, I, you know, I don't try to hold by that. And, you know, the text is Bereshit, Shemot, Wayikro, Bamidbor, Devorim. But nothing in the actual Torah scroll breaks it down and says, this is the name of this part of it, this is the name of that part of it, this, this is the name of this part, this part, this part. You could literally get names out of like every like line, every like segment of the Torah. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Okay, so let's deal with the names of the so-called books of the Torah, you know, which again, the Torah is a scroll. So, you know, it's kind of, let's we'll say there's a book, um, you know, that's kind of what they come up with. So the first part of the Torah that we said Bereshit comes from the first line of the Torah here. Bereshit boro Elohim et oretz. The next one for Shemot, for Exodus, comes from Ele Shemot Bani Yisrael Habaim B'Tzraimu. And then Wayikro, uh, the Leviticus comes from Wayikro El Moshe with a bear Adon Oel Oel. And then, you know, Bemidbar comes from with a bear Adon Oel Moshe, Bemidbar Sinai with Oel Moed. And then the Vorim comes with Ele the Vorim Asher de Bear Moshe, Al Kol Yisroel. Now, there are some people who would think, okay, well, you know, you guys just got those names from the first words of, of the each like part of the Torah. But which, if you look at it, Actually, Bereshit, yeah, that you get, we get the name of that one from the first first uh, word, but Shemoth, we don't get it from the first word, we get it from the second one. So who decided that it's Shemoth rather than Wa'ele? You know, and there are some, uh, you know, Chemushim, you know, especially in Teman, um, the Chemushim from, from there, from Yemen, from the Yemenite Jews, usually calls it Wa'ele Shemoth rather than just Shemoth. So, for example, Wa'yikoro, you know, that comes from the first word. But then if you look at Bemidbar, that's one, two, three, four, five words later. Then you look at Deuteronomy, Devorim, it comes from the second word, Ele Devorim. So where in the written text does it say that this is the name of this particular part of the Torah, and this is the name of this part, and that you use the first word here, second word here, first word here, fifth word here, second word here. The fact that people have these names comes from an oral teaching, an oral Torah. So let me go any further just to show you what I mean by this, by showing an actual Torah scroll. So here in this Torah scroll, this you know is opened up in the very, very beginning of Bereshit, and uh, this this I found on the internet. It actually goes to like maybe it doesn't go through all the entire Torah, but let me just show you what I mean. So if we were to take this Torah and just kind of like slide it along, you know, we find no place here anywhere where we see anything that designates a particular name of any particular section or that there was books of the Torah because all of this is the entire Torah is one scroll. 
you know, so there's nothing here. And this is not the end of the text, but this is as far as this website had for it, this particular ancient scroll, which I think is about 800 years old. There's nothing here that says specifically this is the beginning of this part because there's breaks that happen in the Torah for different things here. And you could literally go back to any section here and say, well, okay, man, this is, the, you know, part of this is one book. This is another book. Here's another book. There's a gap there. You could say every gap is a different book. Literally, you could say that. So the only r way that we get this, because the written Torah never describes five books, for example, of Moses, if you will, or five, well, the, the word humash, you know, to describe it, never comes from the Torah itself. You know, we'd have to say that that's from an oral tradition, for example. So the claim about the structure of the Torah. So one of the claims that, you know, we have to look at is we have to look and say, okay, well, who claims that there's like, you know, you know, five books of Torah? Who claims that the Torah is actually Bereshit all the way to Devarim? Um, this claim comes from all the communities that you see here, that these are ancient Jewish communities that have been ex separated by exile, going back more than 2,500 years uh, into different regions, who when brought back together, you know, about 100 years ago or so, have the same Torah text. Um, you know, I've talked about the differences or just very minor differences, uh, which are not, um, which you would expect more differences based on somebody being in, you know, Europe versus someone being in Yemen who had no contact with each other. Um, and that's why I said it's important that all of the, the above communities from the time of the Torah was given to Mount Sinai until the present era, they all claim that there's been an oral, uh, written an oral Torah, Torah. Um, that there's a historical text, you know, within the communities uh, concerning the ancestry and the way of life, their ancestors. So this be different if, for example, we're dealing with someone who's not from this ancestor, who's making a claim about the Torah, um, you know, versus like the, the people who you know received it not existing. But these communities come directly from uh, the people who received the Torah from Am Yisrael. And this is a, te a claim that has existed within the, within the majority of Jewish communities. And even the ones who claim that there, you know, there is no oral Torah nowadays, if you really look at what their claim is, as I've showed in another video, like, for example, the Karaites, they don't really fully claim that there's no oral Torah. What they claim is that the Talmud is not the representation of it, or that the Mishnah is not the, the written text of the Mishnah that is held by what they call rabbinical Jews. But they have the same idea of something they call Sevel HaYorush and Hekesh, which they say has been passed down from father to son. Well, that's oral Torah. Because you know the I, even the titles themselves don't come from the written text of the Torah. So how does this relate to the idea of you know what people say rabbinical? You know the you know, people call rabbinical Judaism. You know which is you know a modern kind of title, but so be it. Um, you know how does this relate to rabbis, for example? You know, and you know like what people learn from rabbis. You know, and well, let's be aware and let's be clear that the reality is is that in essentially in every Jewish home of every Torah based Jew. The father of the family is considered to be like the rabbi of that family. And what do I mean by that? It means that every father, you know, Jewish father is supposed to be like very um, uh, wise or, you know, very learned in the Torah. And that's why he teaches his children, as we mentioned earlier. So essentially, if you have a family, the parents essentially are like the rabbis of the family, you know, both the father and the mother, because the mother also teaches Torah. Um, but the idea of there being leaders of communities this actually comes from the Torah itself, which I've mentioned in another video, where if you look in the yellow, it says, So essentially, this was the command given by Moshe Rabbeinu's um, father-in-law, um, Yitro, uh, when he saw that Moshe Rabbeinu was like basically sitting as a judge over all the people by himself and you know making rulings and things like this. And his advice to him was, okay, this is not healthy. You know, he says that, uh, you know, basically you need to find men who, you know, you know, fear Hashem, you know, uh, in all of Hashem, they're strong, you know, they have to be men of, you know, of truth who don't, you know, it, you know, basically they hate doing the wrong thing. And he says, you know, for example, in the green, he says, Samtam alahem, you know, meaning you will put on place upon the people of Israel, Sarei alofim, Sarei me'oth, Sarei hamishim, Sarei asaroth. So he says that you have over you place upon them leaders of thousands, leaders of one hundreds, and uh, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. Now it's interesting to note that uh, you know ten is actually the number of Jewish men it takes to have like in a synagogue to have like you know to be able to like do prayers like shachrit, mincha, and arvit. Um, so when you know Jewish men are required every day to three times three, pray three times a day in what's called a minyan, which is a, a group of men who are at least ten. We have a requirement to do that three times a day. So. That means that even in that group of 10, there's supposed to be a leader of that group of 10. So in the Aramaic translation of this thing that, you know, when when uh, Kitro mentioned, the Aramaic translation of the Torah, 
the word used for like sare, sare means like leaders of you know uh, of you know of people. It says it calls them rabane alafe, rabane ma'awatho, rabane hamishin, rabane asoro yotho. So essentially, rabane is that's the word for a rabbi, basically or rav. Um, so they're supposed to be, and that's the word meaning for leader. So a rabbi essentially is just a leader of the community. So let's consider the thing that happens when Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, is told to establish that there would be seven, there would be seventy people with him, seventy men with him who will lead, and you know, also this idea of you know there being like leaders of tens, leaders of fifties, uh, leaders of hundreds, and leaders of thousands. You know, the thing is, if there was no such thing as an oral Torah, why would you need these leaders? And also, the Torah is pretty clear that when these leaders make judgments, that their judgments are basically the, the thing that are supposed to happen, the law, if you will. Um, you know, so where did they learn exactly how to make judgments and, you know, and all that? Well, of course, they, you know, there has to be some central place, and that's considered to be what's called the Sanhedrin. So in the Torah, usually it calls them the Zekanim. Uh, but, you know, Sanhedrin is just a later term to describe the same thing. So why would you need something like this? You know, if the written text is clear, why would you need anybody to be like the Supreme Court, if you will, of the Torah-based nation? Well, easy. One of the things the Torah commands is that we're supposed to like set the months of the year based upon like the certain times of the moon. So the, the Chodesh, um, and we call it Rosh Chodesh, is the beginning of the month. You know, now that's based upon visually seeing certain things in the moon, but the Torah never describes how that process works. It never like systematically describes... Who can be considered a witness for saying that they saw the, you know, the moon? You know, can anybody, can some, you know, some little kid show up and say, I saw it? You know, what if two people like show up and say, I, we saw two different things at two different times in two different locations? How do you analyze it? You know, what are the methodologies? You know, what, you know, the Hebrew text is very ambiguous about how it describes the Yorech. What, what point of the moon describes the beginning of a month? You know, these things are sometimes taken for granted for people who've already, you know, who are already doing things based upon the oral Torah, without, even without knowing it in some cases. Um, you know, so someone looks at their calendar and it says, Rosh Chodesh, you know, the beginning of the month happens, you know, the Jewish calendar happens here. Well, they don't know that that all was established by oral Torah in some cases because they just, maybe they don't study. Um, you know, but all of those things from, come from oral Torah. So in the modern sense, you know, we have a lot of texts that we can use, you know, to understand what the oral Torah was, you know, some of the oldest being like the Talmuds. And then after the Talmud, you know, first, I'm sorry, the Mishnah, and then the Talmud, and so on and so on. And everything after that point is simply to try to explain to later generations things that would have been understood during the era of the Mishnah, or the Talmud, meaning that the Mishnah uses very terse or short language. Uh, to describe things that obviously would need more explanation. So the Talmud is that more explanation in many cases of what's in the Mishnah, because again, generations later from the Mishnah may not have fully understood it, especially if they were living in exile. So imagine, for example, the Torah gives a bunch of laws about how to do agriculture, specifically in the land of Israel. Well, what do you do if you've been in exile for like, let's say 200 years, and you've never even been to Israel? How do you, you know, deal with like what the Mishnah says in the shorthand? What do you do about the Torah? When it has even shorter hand, um, you know, the rest of the Tanakh is also shorthand. So the Talmud, you know, the Mishnah initially, you know, is the explanation for that generation of, you know, things that were like orally transmitted about how to understand and properly do the Torah. And then the Talmud goes and tries to explain both, you know, what's in the Tanakh as well as what's in the Mishnah and gives additional information. And then later texts, for example, like the Mishnah Torah, where the Rambam saw that there was a need to try to take that information and condense it down in a form so that anyone could be able to like take the Tanakh and then go through and actually do the mitzvot and figure out what they are. And then they could also study the Talmud once they have a better understanding, because the Talmud has things that deal with you know different topics in different places in the text. Um, you know where he you know looked to condense that down in a in a way to where you could basically have the judgments you know based upon his understanding. Um, and be able to, like, for example, take one book and say, okay, you know, how do I do the laws of, you know, like, you know, agriculture? Okay, well, here's a section of the book that deals just strictly with the agricultural laws. And here's the basis for how I understand how to do it and make judgments based upon it. And then person can take the Talmud and say, okay, now that I have a, a clear understanding of what all the, the laws about, you know, that area are, anytime it shows up in the Talmud, I have a better understanding of it. And I can, you know, basically have a summary. Um, the same thing with Shulchan Ruk, you know, um, collects together kind of, you know, sources from the Rambam and other sources to like make an even shorter, you know, area, just mainly of like things that are done. Um, and I think specifically there's some who say that this is mostly for rabbis to kind of use initially, um, but it's used, you know, in everyday life. And there's other books, you know, that, you know, are written by other, um, you know, rabbis to kind of explain, you know, things that they had received orally. Um, so, so that later generations who didn't have that information or couldn't see it from the time from they lived in would have the ability to, you know, understand it better. 
So by like token, if you go to any ancient Jewish community and you look at the leaders of those communities, every single one of them will agree that there was an oral Torah. Now, in this picture here, I'm basically showing you leaders from both, you know, Middle Eastern Jewish communities, um, you know, um, both the Mizrahim, Temanim, Sephardim, um, and then also from European Jewish communities, Ashkenazim, and also Ethiopian Jews. Now, it's important to note, with pe there are people who have said for years that the Ethiopian Jews didn't have an oral Torah. And I've actually looked this up. This is actually not true at all. They had they didn't have the Talmud, but they had their own form of oral Torah. They had explanations that were orally passed down through what's called the the Kes the Kesim, uh, Kesiot, I think some people used to call it. Um, you know, who were essentially, if you will, the rabbis of their communities. You know, and essentially they did things like let's say determine exactly what parts of the Tanakh are read and when. You know, they did things like, for example, explaining how to actually do something. You know, what they said was, you know, basically law because they were the leaders of those communities. Um, there's never been a community that doesn't have some form of oral transmission or oral understanding of how the Tanakh is specifically supposed to be done. So right now what I want to do is do a, I want to kind of look at, um, you know, two separate Jewish communities with a third one that I'm going to kind of use. And it's actually four Jewish communities, but I want to look at them in, in the terms of the distance they have from each other and the, in the, uh, the same understanding they have of the Torah and the oral Torah. So what I want to do here is I'm not going to read all this to you. I mean, you could basically pause the video and read it. Um, it's important to look and say, okay, well, who are these ancient Jewish communities that you hear me talking about all the time? So one of them is the Jews of Yemen and the Jews of Haban, which is essentially in one of the same locations in the Middle East, in uh, Southern Arabia. Um, but essentially, you know, these communities go back, you know, to the first temple period. Um, it's uh, according to oral tradition, the Jews of Yemen um, first arrived in Yemen during the first temple period. Um, you know, there's like stories of how that happened. You know, I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, but at one point, they were they were a pretty much independent uh, kingdom outside of the land of Israel after the destruction of the first temple. Um, in later periods, there were like you know local uh, people from the, the areas that converted to Judaism and joined the communities until um, Islam came in on the scene. So both of these communities from uh, Yemen and Haban had uh, you know oral Torah. You know the oral Torah existed there along with the written text of the Torah. Okay, so let's go a little bit further and look at. Two other Jewish communities, we want to look at the Jews of Libya, who, you know, you can look at the history here of when the Jews of Libya came there. Same kind of thing. There's like a oral tradition that, that during the first temple period, temple period, there were Jews living in Libya in northern Africa. And also we want to look at the Jews of Iraq. So there's often a claim that people make that the Jews of Iraq, once the exile happened, that they're the ones who kind of formed this idea of, of several things, that they're the ones who came up with the text of the Torah, the written Torah, and that they're also the people who invented, um, you know, for example, um, certain ideas. Um, you know, one of them that some people claim is that, you know, before this point, Jews didn't believe only in like Hashem, they were like, you know, polytheist or something like that. But if you look at all these different communities and the distance they have from each other, they all have the same Torah text and they also have the same oral tradition, even though they had been separated until recently by, you know, like basically miles and miles of distance in some cases. And in each of these areas, there were always Jewish communities that were separated even from their local communities. So for example, in Libya, you had people who were living in like, you know, at one point mountains that went to escape and lived in caves and had complete separation from other Jewish communities in Libya for like, you know, like centuries, you know, until like, you know, people had found them, you know, before the state of Israel and they were brought here. Same thing in Yemen, you had some isolated Jewish communities. But when you bring all these communities back together, you're looking at the same Torah. So whether you're looking at a, a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll from Yemen and from, um, you know, Libya, it's the same text. Now that was maintained through oral tradition. And what do I mean by that? In order for someone to sit down and write this text, with the way it is, for example, one of the elements of it is that they'd have to have a text that predated it that is ancient that they could use to copy it from, but also the rules of how to copy it and how to write it are not specifically covered in the text, and that's from oral tradition. So the oral tradition tells you how to maintain the written text, and you'll notice that, again, this sentence here and this sentence here, these group of uh, you know lines here are the same line, but... Who's to say that someone in Libya couldn't have moved this a little bit further this way and spaced it differently than someone in Yemen? You'll notice that this line here is the same as this line here, and the spacings are spaced out in the same areas. Well, who's to say that someone could have thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of the space. Who needs the space? What is this for? You know, this is all based on oral tradition to put these spaces here because of the fact that someone could, you know, says, okay, you can't change this text. This is the way it was received from Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the way it has to be. And if someone in Yemen said the same thing as someone in Libya, 
where it would have made more sense based on the distance for someone in, you know, for example, Yemen or Libya or vice versa or any location to say, I'm not going to do what was being done before. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to change this around a little bit to make it more functional. I don't feel like making a space here. I'm using too much animal skin, you know, because Torah scrolls are written on animal skin. You know, someone say, I, I got too much trouble trying to get, you know, we don't eat enough beef here. to like, you know, get enough skin off an animal to make a Torah scroll, I'm going to shorten and condense this down a bit. I don't like this word. I'm going to change it. You know what I mean? So the oral Torah is, you know, is what gives you the ability to say that there's an, a written Torah, um, especially in the format that it exists in today. And just to be clear, when we talk about the distances between some of these communities, I mean, for example, you have Jews in Spain who have the same Sefer Torah as Jews in Yemen. You know, prior to like, you know, air travel, and even today, you know, for example, a lot of these places are hard to get to. I mean, if someone decided, I'm going to like go from Spain to Yemen, the first question is, a couple thousand years ago, how did he even know Yemen existed or what Yemen even was or where it was? Who's to say this is in Yemen? You know, someone says, I want to go to Teman. I want to, I've heard that there's Jews in Teman. How do you get there? You know, it's not like you would have been able to pull out a map in many locations and say, okay, well, I'll just take a boat across here. We'll walk or ride something around here. We'll go around here. Someone could have said, okay, well, Yemen, I'll just go this way. You know, where is it? You know, they don't know. You know, so to have this kind of distance between communities, you know, we said this is around where Libya is and Yemen is, to have someone hiding in the cave somewhere around here, and then someone like, for example, isolated here, to return here years later, and thousands of years later, and have the same Torah text as with all these different people from all these different locations, is something that you could say it's a miracle, basically, because when you look at other cultures, you don't have that. You don't have a culture that's been dispersed to different parts, and they come back with the same oral and written text. Um, you know, with, you know, essentially the same, you know, you don't have that. I mean, think about any culture that you want to say that has a written history of themselves that are separated. And then like all, you know, different parts of the world. And when all of them return, they have the same text. And the thing that's also interesting is in each of these communities, nobody was willing to give up their text and trade it for someone else, you know, for the most part. So this is what we look at. Okay. So if we look at any Torah scroll, we're going to find the same common information and the oral Torah is what backs it up. You know, that this is the oral, that this is the written Torah, you know, the written Torah could be something completely different. I mean, for example, this is the Samaritan Torah. There's 6,000 differences between this Torah and all of these other Torahs here. But yet, even with those 6,000 differences, it's still the same text in the same order with the same names, you know, of uh, certain like parts of the text. And, you know, the differences, you know, between them are, you know, basically mostly like choices and words and something that, you know, here is written out in a certain way. But, you know, when it comes to the oral Torah is taught that the text really means this, you know, the way that most people, scholars would say is that someone took the oral understanding of what's written here and inserted it into the Samaritan text in order to say that this text is superior to this one that the Jews have because of the fact that our text explains it clearly. Where the Jewish text, you read and say, okay, well, look, just because your text says, you know, Adonai Jibor Melchomo, you know, and ours says Ish Melchomo, the understanding of our text is that Ish Melchomo means he's a Gibor Melchomo. You just simply wrote it out in your text, you know, to make it seem superior. You know, so for example, one of the things in the written Torah, um, it, you know, someone who doesn't have the oral Torah would say, okay, well, it sounds like Hashem did work on Shabbat because of the way the text is written. Where the Samaritans, wrote their Torah in a way to where it's obvious that Hashem didn't do work in Shabbat, the same way that the Jewish understanding is about the way the text is written and what it means. So they simply took the oral Torah of, you know, how to understand the text in many places and inserted, inserted it into their written text. You know, so this is another example of there obviously have been an oral Torah of Jews who take this text and say, hey, this is what it means. You know, it's written this way, but it means this based upon the oral understanding. And the Samaritans have in their text the oral understanding in their text in many places. Then that means that there was an oral Torah because if their text is like, let's say, 2,000 years old or so, and they had this information in there that way, then that means that they took an oral Torah and, you know, and simply inserted it into their text so that when people read it and say, ah, well, this must be the original text because the, the challenges we have here about what's written here. And, you know, ignoring the oral Torah, of course, ignoring the oral Torah, I don't want to accept the Jews oral Torah. I don't want to believe what they want to say, but their written text is inferior to the Samaritan text because the Samaritans have, the, you know, it explains it better. You know, it has what, what is the original, but there are some scholars who said that, no, that makes, that points out that it's not the original text. If there are challenges in this text, somebody would have corrected it. You know, if it made more, you know, made more sense. But if someone says, well, this is the way it was written, the oral understanding explains it this way. We don't we're going to change what's written here in order to supposedly make it into a better text. You know, if I'm going to do that, that's not the original text. And that's my own personal explanation. 
But, you know, the people say, okay, well, this shows that this is not the original text because of the fact that they inserted things to try to make it superior, you know, to give the oral tradition life within the written text. So in conclusion, this video, you know, was my attempt to show that essentially there is, you know, within the, uh, the, the written text itself, proof of there being an oral text. And the fact that the written text exists has the, you know, the oral Torah behind it, you know, because of the fact that all of the information in the text itself, how it's written, is determined by the oral Torah. And even identifying that this is the text of the written Torah comes from the oral Torah, because before, um, you know, a certain point, the non-Jewish world didn't even know what the Torah was, the written text of the Torah. They wouldn't have been able to read it, understand it, ident or even identify it. So if, you, if someone were to ask, okay, well, what is, the, what is a Torah, a written Torah? Only the Jews would have known that. And that's based upon an oral tradition, because who's to say it isn't something else? You know, who's to say that it isn't, you know, for example, it's like this Torah scroll here, who's to say that the written Torah is only up to here, that it's not anything beyond that point? You know, well, obviously there's, that's the oral Torah that says the Torah begins here, and ends on the other side of this over here. That is the the written Torah, and that's one of the reasons that in you know synagogues, you know, when the Torah is read from, at some point in the service, for example, the Torah is raised, and people you know will say that this is the Torah that Moshe gave to us. You know that that's an oral um, identification that this text is the valid text. Where if someone had held up something different, you know, like if this was all, you know, like in different sections and different places, written in a different language with different stories, someone would say, that's not the Torah we received from Moshe Rabbeinu. How do you know? Because my father taught me, his father taught him, and his father taught him going back thousands of years. And not only because he taught me, because of the fact that in this other community that we didn't even know about until like recently, they had the same thing. And in another community that we didn't know about until recently, they had the same thing. In another community that we heard about, but never saw or never met, they have the same thing. So the oral Torah is what gives you the ability to say that there's a written Torah. Um, so this is Ahab Ever from the Chronicles of Ahab Ever. Thank you for listening. Take care and bye.